Where am I getting it from?
Let's pray. God of grace and God of glory, on these wonderful people pour now thy power. Thou hast been our God from generation to generation. God, for 730 days, we have struggled in this pandemic. But God, in spite of the struggles, you have shown yourself and revealed yourself over and over again. You've given us the strength to preach like the Reverend Jerina Lee. You've given us strength to preach like Sojourner Truth. You've given us strength to pray, face the east, face the north, face the west like Daniel and Solomon. God, you have given us the sacrifice of Esther that said, Lord, even in pandemic, you have constantly revealed yourself. So God, as we go into the next, whatever we're going into in days and weeks, and perhaps even months, we're going to be like those psalmists that said, I can't wait to get in the gates of the church. We'll open our doors wide. And say to the people, come, let us worship and adore him. Come, let us sing praises of joy. Come, and let us show this dying world that you're worth serving. We have heard, God, that we should stand and plant trees. We've been told that we need to sharpen iron. So tonight, God, Bishop McKenzie is going to tell us. But thus saith the Lord in the new season that we shall face. We thank you, God, for Clement W. Few, who has guided this ship with hands of love, guided this ship with steady feet, guided the ship of a heart full of love, care, and concern. So, Lord, as we prepare ourselves for this upcoming annual conference season and not too long from now. Be with us. Be with us, God, as we come back into our churches, as we feel our choir stands, as we give from the king's riches and possibly even from the widow's might. We pray, dear God, that you would be pleased with us, that you'll look down from heaven, say, that's my son, that's my daughter, and I'm well pleased. So Lord, prepare us for the time that faces us. Let us look in the wind and still say God can steal the wind. Let us look at the flood and tell that God can roll back the waters of the flood. Be with us tonight, God. Let our praise be representative of your goodness. Let our praise be representative of your riches and glory. Let our praise be all that is needed in such a time as this. Bless us, sanctify us, Call us out from among the doubting Thomases. Call us out among the people that doubt how good you are. And even in a time of tyranny, let us talk about justice. In a time of divisiveness, let us talk about our unity and love together. Bless this worship experience. Bless those in the virtual space that will experience the kind of glory that you're so worthy. You're so worthy of receiving. Open up the windows of heaven. And as we give, let it be representative, God, of your value 
in your word. Let this prayer fall upon your heart, God, and shower down glory to us. May you be edified. May you be blessed. And may you be given praise of which you're so worthy of. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this college of bishops that we're blessed with today. Thank you for the general officer that we're so blessed to, to be in their presence tonight, God. But they represent the genius of African Methodism. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us, let us just enjoy the music to speak to our souls and spirits for such a time as this. Amen. I will be reading to you from the Old Testament, the King James Version, Isaiah chapter 40, 28 through 31. Join me. Let's listen to what thus says the Lord. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall, and they shall walk and not faint. May the Lord bless the reading, the hearing, and the application of his holy word. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'll be reading the epistle, and it's coming from the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 3. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that we that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen the word of God for the people of God
Will you stand for the reading of the gospel according to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8? It is the parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow. And there was a widow who in that town kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps coming and bothering me, I will see she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for the chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. dwells. of the commandments was the most important this is what he said you shall love the lord your god with all of your heart with all of your soul and all of your mind this is the first and the great commandment and the second is like unto it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend all the laws and the prophets glory be to the father How you doing? Good evening, everyone. Okay, it's giving time.
Amen. <laughs> okay, and this is our missionary benevolent offering. And we are asking for $10. Um, we offer you Cash App, Cash App, that's dollar sign, fifth AME. We offer Givelify, fifth Episcopal district of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Or you can mail in your offering at 4519 Admiral, Admiralty Way, Suite 205, Marina Del Rey, California, 90292. When we also take debit and credit cards. <laughs> There's no excuse. <laughs> and as our ushers are coming forward, amen. It's hardly no way for us not to touch something in offering like this. So if you will, in each category, just simply pass your offering to your left. Pass it to your left and the person closest to the aisle receive your offering and ushers will simply come and receive from the end of every pew. Pass your offering to the left. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Boyd. So as you are doing that, I will read for you. Oh, One more time. Again, for those of you that are online, the address is 4519 Admiralty Way, Suite 205, Marina Del Rey, California, 90292. Again, we take debit and credit cards. And I'll read our cash app one more time in case we did not get that. That is dollar sign fifth, that's five one five T H A M E. And then Givelify, fifth Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And the fifth is spelled out. Okay. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth him. May we all stand for the missionary offering, our benediction. In the name of the trying God, may the spirit of Christian missions enter every heart. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
The joy of the Lord is my strength, and the strength of the Lord is my joy. Good evening. On behalf of Bishop Clement W. Few, the 131st elected and consecrated bishop, Supervisor Alexia Few, we come this evening to acknowledge our guests, our friends, our greetings, and to make announcements. So to Bishop Vashtime McKenzie, Vashtime Murphy McKenzie, the 117th Bishop, and to Bishop Francine Brookins, the 141st Bishop, we welcome you to this gathering. We are here to reflect the state of the fifth. And I want you to know that the fact that President Biden is doing the State of the Union this evening has not kept some of our friends from wanting to greet us. We have waiting online, I believe, Brother Cecil, State Senator Sidney Kamlaga Dove, representing many of our churches in the California State Senate. She has left the chambers in order to greet us this evening. Is she ready to speak to us? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Can we raise the volume a little? Senator, please speak. Good evening, and thank you all for having me. I would like to first give honor to God for whom all blessings flow, and I too am worthy of receiving. It is my honor to be with you tonight to participate in the 2022 AME Church 5th District Mid-Year Conference, and it is a blessing to be able to see so many of you all in attendance. I am in Sacramento working, but I am receiving my blessing through the virtual space. I would like to give greetings to Bishop Clement W. Few, presiding bishop of the 5th Episcopal District, Bishop Vashti McKenzie, retired, Mrs. Alexis Few, Episcopal Supervisor, Connectional Leadership of African Methodism, Leadership of the 5th Episcopal District, Churches of the Los Angeles area and loyal members, Reverend John E. Cager, President of Southern California Conference Ministerial Alliance, Reverend J. Edgar Boyd, Host Pastor and FA and Fame LA Host Church, of which one of my staff members is a proud member and congregant, and ecumenical friends, visitors, and friends to this fifth district mid year session. You know, I just finished a meeting discussing how the state will need to re-up its partnership with our faith-based communities. As we navigate this endemic, protect ourselves against future pandemics and begin the rebuilding of our communities with you front and center. There is a lot at stake and we are dependent on trusted messengers like you. The AME Church is known for its civic engagement and I have enjoyed being of service to you. And it is my plan and hopefully uh, through the grace of God that I will be given the opportunity to continue that service as your future Congresswoman. I solicit your continued support and prayers and thank you for this evening. I hope you notice that perhaps Sister Joy Richardson, who's a member of First Amy Los Angeles, gave the protocol to her boss. And so the protocol has been established. <laughs> But we want Dr. Teresa Fry Brown and Dr. Mark Kelly Tyler and Reverend Gregory Eason and Dr. Daryl Williams to know you're in the place where we think big. 
We are a part of achieving big, hairy, audacious goals. Is that correct? And so our entire presiding elders council, uh, led by presiding elder Roosevelt Lindsay, our host pastor, J. Edgar Boyd, and the famed Los Angeles family, all of the leadership of the Fifth Episcopal District and all of our annual conferences are pleased this evening to come together both virtually and in person. We are mastering hybrid. We will not go away because it is the essence of evangelism that will take us forward, isn't it? We have several other messages. We did mention that President Biden is making a speech, but Congresswoman Karen Bass did not want to be missing from this gathering. So she sends a message from the US Congress. Tonight, I am in the US Capitol attending President Biden's State of the Union speech. So I'm not able to join you as you attend the 5th Episcopal District Media Conference. I applaud your quadrennial theme of thinking big. That's what I'm doing as I seek the mayoral office of the city of Los Angeles. Big plans, big dreams, big visions can inspire us and keep us focused even in times of trouble. I would like to thank and offer my presiding bishop, Clement W. Few of the 5th Episcopal District and Supervisor Alexia Few, along with retired Supervisor Vashti McKenzie and I'm sorry, Bishop Vashti McKenzie and Bishop Francine Brookins and the Connectional Leadership of African Methodism for your work and support and faithfulness during the past two pandemic years. Likewise, I'd like to thank the leadership of the 5th Episcopal District and all of the AME churches worldwide who deserve recognition for sustaining AME congregations and communities they serve, even as the need for assistance and faith have rarely been greater. Loyal members and lay leadership of the churches of the Los Angeles area, including several in my district, have suffered losses, but also inspired all of us with their services to their fellow human beings and surrounding neighborhoods. I'd also like to mention the president of the Los Angeles Ministerial Alliance, Reverend John E. Cager, and the host pastor, Reverend J. Edgar Boyd, as they host this meeting. In years past, I've had the pleasure of joining AME leaders, members, ecumenical friends, visitors, and everyone attending the fifth district media session. I look forward to a time when we're all together again safely. I offer my sincere gratitude for the role that many churches, both in my district and throughout the region, have played in combating the coronavirus pandemic. Your ministry sprang into action to assist people with food and necessities as the lockdowns helped us slow the spread you offered your parking lots for testing sites and vaccine clinics. You worked to educate people about how to keep themselves and their families safe. I feel deeply grateful for your efforts. Homelessness is one of the many things that could not be worse during the pandemic, and homelessness continues to be disproportionately affecting African Americans. I remember that Bishop Few, when he first came to this district, offered significant grants to organizations to help combat this terrible problem. I appreciate what he did and what your ministries do every day to reach out to those suffering without housing. And I look forward to working with you to make a serious progress in creating housing and caring for the unhoused. We have all seen COVID-9 worsen existing problems and inequities in our society, but I remain hopeful that we can come together to make the most of the opportunities provided by the bold actions here in Congress and the president to help address these issues. In particular, I want to call attention to the fact that many AME churches have community development corporations associated with them. I hope these mission-driven organizations will seek out opportunities to direct some of the funding coming from Washington through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act toward the housing development and other needs in our communities. I wish you the best in the work that you do here and can't wait until I have a chance to be with you again. Sincerely, Karen Bass, member of Congress. And finally, closer to home, Supervisor Holly J. Mitchell, the only African-American member of our Board of Supervisors is currently the president of LA County. She sends her regrets because she has been asked tonight to respond to the State of the Union. So we have three African-American women 
who are stellar in their leadership and representation for us and who appreciate African Methodism. And finally, let me just say in this period, as we have come together in a way that we have not for over two years, some of us come having said farewell to loved ones, having been happy and pleased and joyous that God welcomed them into glory. I don't know about you, but I raised my hand because that's a part of it. Sometimes we say we regret, we miss them, but I want us to say thank you, Jesus, for the time we had together and for welcoming them home. And that brings to mind, on behalf of Bishop and Mrs. Few, that we are not left here just to sit. We're left here to make a difference. So big, hairy, audacious goals is not a recitation of something we can envision. It must be something that God gives us so we don't know how it's going to happen, how it's going to make fall, but we know only God will make it happen for us. And so we start with something very simple. We can go across the hall where the vendors are and recycle some black dollars. They have come to support us. They have come in trying times. No matter what it is, get something and thank them and encourage them. We also say to you, as you go back and come out of your component section, Bishop Few has said, don't just do something. He wants us to shock him. Now he's so calm, I don't know how we're gonna shock him. So you're gonna to have to pray about that. But we want him to say, I just didn't know how that was going to happen. So fifth district, the state of the fifth is good. And as we let God lead us, the state of the fifth district will be more than we can ever ask, imagine, or dream. God bless you. First, give it out of the God. In my life, in the military and the corporate world and the AME church, I've had the experience of serving with many different leaders with different leadership styles. As most of you are aware, there are a number of different leadership styles. Autocratic, uh, the authoritarian focus on results. The democratic, the supportive, one and productive. Then we have the servantship style. In the servantship style is a relationship builder. He's one who's passionate in their belief in God. In 2006, God sent the fifth district a servant leader and his helpmate, Supervisor Alex Butlerfield. Will, will you stand as I introduce to some and present to others the 131st elected and consecrated bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Clement W. Few. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Say hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Please be seated. I was reminded when I came over earlier this week that almost two years to the day, we were 
opening a mid-year conference, the place was full from front to back on the opening. And about five o'clock the next morning, we received a call uh, from the governor saying that no assemblies more than 250 could be in one space at one time. And we were in our strategy meeting by 6.30, pulled the air wall between uh, the front and the back of this space and continued with the work the Lord has placed upon our hearts and minds to do to his glory. Amen. Amen. So we do not take this moment for granted. Out of all the Lord has brought us by his love and still he doth our help afford and hides our lives above. So thank you. Thank each of you uh, who uh, has come out tonight to, to be a part of this opening of our fifth Episcopal district mid-year conference. Uh, I want to thank Reverend Edgar Boyd and Florence Boyd and my home church in the fifth district, First AME Church for your spectacular entertainment. Won't you please give him a hand, give him a hand. Give him a hand. Thank you. I mean, we just said host. They took it from there, and all that you see uh, is a part of their spirit when it comes to hospitality. So uh, we thank you. I want to thank the presiding elder council of the Fifth Episcopal District for your leadership during this season, keeping the pastors encouraged and pastors keeping the congregations encouraged even in the midst of, of virtual worship and all these creative methods that you've used to financially underwrite the cost of doing ministry in this district. So I thank each of you laypersons for your faithfulness uh, through it all. Amen. Amen. I am deeply humbled and appreciative for all that you do and that you continue to do. We are blessed tonight to have with us a guest, uh, Mrs. Jackie DuPont Walker presented some of our out of district guests. I want to acknowledge the presence of Brother Maurice Wright, uh, who is, he blends in so well among us. It's just kind of hard to distinguish him. Um, and tomorrow, at noon, Reverend Eason will preach. Mrs. Eason is here with him. Uh, and um, we will hear from our visitors in a formal way on tomorrow uh, in the afternoon session. There have been some changes that have taken place, as uh, Jack has said, since we met in this place two years ago. Um, we had just organized our delegation for the general conference, elected the person serving on the Episcopal Committee, and we were pledging our support for the standard barrel for Episcopal service. Um, even though she was en route from somewhere else, we were still celebrating her. And once she arrived, uh, we heard from our candidate. And it's my pleasure tonight to present her as the 141st Bishop of the Church in the person of Francine. So at some point tonight, or unless she's going to be here tomorrow morning, you'll say hello to the peoples. 
<laughs> well said, thank you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome into our midst uh, a former colleague in the person of the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, the Executive Director of Research and Scholarship for the denomination. Amen. And now for the job I was scripted to do, uh, and that is to present a friend, a friend. Uh, I met Bishop McKenzie for the first time in Dayton, Ohio, in <laughs> 1980 something. <laughs> And in 1991, we graduated uh, as classmates as the HBG hit scholars from United Seminary um, and have been uh, friends and colleagues over these years. Um, I just admit on the, on the council, as you know, among any a collegial group, there are persons who are colleagues and there are persons who are friends that you trust and count on and depend on. And Bishop McKenzie is that uh, for me. Um, Brother Stan and Bishop McKenzie brought their family to our home upon their assignment, first Thanksgiving, that they were in Tennessee, and we have celebrated our friendship all these years. I was um, looking for something to print in the booklet uh, to describe, to be a bio for Bishop McKenzie, and I went uh, out on the internet, Wikipedia, and I decided I'd craft from what I found what I should write. And I sent it to her to read, and she sent me back what I should print. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, what struck me most out of what I saw was in the last paragraph that she wrote. Um, she and Dr. Stan, husband and wife for about 52 years or more, um, in the closing, um, she opened the paragraph with what her relationship uh, was to Stan, and I found it so profound. And we are happy as a district uh, to be able to contribute to the McKenzie Foundation to keep Stan's work alive, even though he does not walk among us. So thank you, Bishop. Thank you. She comes tonight as our preacher. We invite those of you who are in Zoom land to join those of us who are in Los Angeles. As I invite you to fold back the flap of your tent door, to move your stool to the opening, blot out all distractions. I believe the Lord has sent this vessel with just what we need for the journey. So come and stoop and listen and drink deeply for the way ahead is so uncertain and we pause tonight for a refreshing. Father God, fill your vessel. For those of us who are hungry and thirsty for a word, a word
word beyond the 5th Episcopal District, a word that travels to Ukraine, a word that pervades the atmosphere in Washington, D.C., and covers all who believe in you with a canopy of hope and love and peace and justice. Speak, Lord, for those of us whom you call together want to hear what your spirit has to say to the church. In Jesus' name, amen.
I know. All right, there it is. Jesus will. Uh-huh, oh, I know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, he will. I know that he is and he will. That he's the reward of them that diligently seek him. Oh, yes, I know he will. Because he already did it. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that this time you have allowed us to come and assemble in this place. That we have already felt your presence as you move from heart to heart and breast to breast. Now, God, come and settle among us and preach your word. But we need to hear a word in an uncertain season. Come give us a sure word and a sure assurance in an uncertain season. And I, your servant, get out of the way that you would have your way today. That somebody might be saved, healed, and delivered. And we give you the credit and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we praise. Come on, say amen. amen. It's all right to say amen again. Put your hands together and bless God tonight. Come on, put your hands together as you find your seat and bless the Lord. Amen. To Bishop Clement W. Few, a colleague and friend, God bless you, presiding prelate of the 5th Episcopal District. The supervisor, Few, God bless you, praise God for you. Uh, to the president of the presiding elders council, presiding elder Lindsay, the host, uh, pastor, uh, Pastor Boyd and first lady Boyd, to the presiding elders of the district, to the connectional officers and those you have served, uh, God bless each and every one of you, Dr. Mayberry, Sister Mayberry, all I see is if I start calling all y'all, I'm going to mess up and half y'all going to go mad because I didn't call your name, amen? Just make pretend I called all your names and say amen, all right? Amen. I see you throwing up signs in the sanctuary, uh-huh, throwing up signs in the sanctuary. I see you, my soul, Lord. God bless you, praise God. Look at it, throwing up signs in the sanctuary. Look at that, look at that, signs in the sanctuary. All right, don't start now. We don't want nobody else to get excited. Amen, praise God. Thank you so much for extending the invitation to share uh, in, uh, in your uh, midday celebration. Uh, to my colleague, uh, Bishop Brookins, God bless you, praise the Lord. She's doing an excellent job, I want you to know. I used to serve in the 18th Episcopal District, and they say she's doing good. She's doing good, Bishop. You ain't got to worry about a daggone thing. I said, thank you so much. Amen. Uh, to Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, congratulations on your new elevation as Associate Dean and leading uh, the bandy preaching, right? Am I saying that right? Amen. Uh, congratulations to you. There is a word from the Lord, and I trust that you are preaching. I want to thank you, Bishop Few, and Supervisor Few in the 5th District for the support of the McKenzie Foundation. Uh, we have been giving scholarships to student athletes at Paul Quinn College. My husband had a burden for student athletes because he said in his life, they were significant people when he was in high school and college to help coach and mentor him uh, so that when he got to the NBA, uh, that he could be as successful as he could be, uh, not just in the game, but basketball, football is a young man's game. And the game was, uh, is on the way to the real deal in life, uh, who counseled him and mentored him so that when it came to the real deal in life, he was ready and prepared. And so we have given over $20,000 thus far to student athletes this year. And with your help, we'll be able to do even more in this semester and next year. And we are grateful. There is a word from the Lord, and it comes tonight from Acts, the 27th chapter. Acts, the 27th chapter, and I will begin reading at verse 20. Hear the word of the Lord, and I'm reading from the New International Version. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. 
last night an angel of, the, of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who say, sail with you. So keep up your courage, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. This is the word of the Lord. And our text then is verse 25. Wherefore, be of good courage, Mm -hmm. or be of good cheer, I believe God. In the message version, it says this. So dear friends, take heart. I believe God will do exactly what he told me. And our theme and thought of meditation in this hour is God is still able. Go find somebody and tell them God is still able. Come on, find somebody else and say God is still able. Find somebody else and say, oh, yeah, he is. Oh, yeah, he is. Beloved of God, we live with impossibilities every single day. Uh, there are daily occurrences that we deem not worth considering because they lie beyond the borders of feasibility. They are instances that appear on the radar screen of our lives that are incapable of being done by any human male or female rich or poor, or any hue, history, or heritage. We live with impossibilities every single day of our lives. There are things beyond reach and other things beyond our control. There are things out of the question and things that refuse to be questioned. And there are things beyond our reach and things that are within reach uh, as you can look, but you cannot touch. Impossibility is alive and well. It sits at the door of every new idea. It is at the table of every discussion of direction and destination. It hovers on the edge of innovation and it's a nuisance to creativity. Impossibility is the thorn in the flesh of progress, the fly in the ointment of advancement, the bitter pill of improvement, the, uh -huh, the Achilles heels of every movement, from the abolitionist movements, the women's rights movement, the temperance movement, the labor movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, to Occupy Wall Street movement and Black Lives Matter. Impossibility is a member in good and regular standing in every church. I'll say amen for you. You ain't got to say nothing, I'll just sit there and look, but I'll say amen for you. Because impossibility is a member in good and regular standing in every church. In fact, impossibility has held every office and position available. Impossibility is or has been a steward, a trustee, a member of the official board. Impossibility has served in every position in the Women's Missionary Society, the organized lay the official board, and the church conference. Impossibility leads deliberation and dialogue of every challenge and change. Amen, Vastar. It is the first to voice concerns and to declare that there is no way this is going to happen in here. I'm sorry, excuse me. Voice its concern and declare there is no way out and there's no way through. With its negative self refuses that see that what is going on just might be a breakthrough. Instead, you're sitting there praying that it'll be a breakdown. Impossibility, are y'all still here? Impossibility is the secretary of every meeting, keeping track of every encroachment on the status quo. To be sure to nip expansion in the bud with its denominational slogan until you know what freezes over. The path of progress to progress is littered with impossibilities. Fears fuel fractured relationships behind closed doors at the home, church, and in work spaces. Self-interest and selfish interest devalue proactive progress, which makes knee-jerk reactions a necessity. 
phobias devalue our diverse citizenry and governance is fueled by privilege and supremacies that demand the cultural conformity based on hue and hair. Amen, Vasta. Our one nation under God's country's original sin enslavement is deeply interwoven into the DNA of everything from politics to the militarization of community policing public education to ethnic polarization, the disregard for the rule of law by leaders in high places. There is the trivialization of voters' rights, our right to vote, the escalation of voter suppression, the obstruction of justice by those who should be champions of justice, and the disregard for fair and fair play by those who should know better. Then there is the tyranny of despotic leadership uh, willing to engage in unprovoked conflict uh, with their neighbors uh, that creates another set of international impossibilities. Everybody, yeah, everybody, I said everybody yeah, in this room tonight uh, is facing their own set of impossibilities. And our impossibilities are not all the same. Our impossibilities run the gamut of exhaustion or uh, frustration or it's anxiety. When I get to yours, just say amen. Or it's stress or it's a reasonable portion of health or being in your right mind on any given moment or facing neglect or struggling to have physical and emotional well-being. Uh, there's safety at home impossibilities and safety on the street impossibilities. You just can't walk somewhere sometime. Everybody has their own set of impossibilities. A relentless panic has changed absolutely everything, has changed the world, has changed our world, has changed our minds, and it'll never be the same again places you've been trying to go you just can't get there now things you've been trying to get by uh, still elude you uh, positions you prepared all your life uh, goes to somebody else uh, dreams you've been dreaming uh, have never come true uh, when i get to your say amen uh, hope you've been hoping for uh, but hope fails to rise at the right time uh, stuff you needed is stuff you've never received amen vast time suffering you tried to avoid or the energy you invested in trying to change or fix stuff or deny stuff has depleted your spiritual reserves or people you have tried to shake like dust from your shoes or scatter like the stars when the sun overcomes a darkened sky act like mountains that refuse to get out of your way Everybody, everybody, did I say everybody, everybody, everybody in this room have their own set of impossibilities. We've all had our last straw and down to our last nerve moments that can be characterized as impossible. We live with impossibility every single day of our lives. And the Bible reminds us of a few impossibilities. What, what, what you say, what you say. Yeah, it's impossible for God to lie. Yeah, for God's not a man uh, that he should lie. Yeah, there are a bunch of folk uh, trying to build a tower to heaven. Uh, and God says if we let them, uh, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Uh, Amnon was obsessed uh, with what seemed impossible for him and his sister. Uh, it's impossible uh, for bulls and goats uh, to take away the sins uh, of humanity. And uh, without faith, uh, it's impossible to please God. Uh, Yet, uh, the Bible is clear uh, that in spite uh, of daily impossibilities, uh, if uh, we keep doing what is right, uh, we shall reap uh, it. Counting among those who love the Lord, uh, all things still work together for good uh, to them who love the Lord uh, and are called uh, according to his purpose. And if uh, God be for you, uh, no one can be against you. Ah, uh, with faith the size of a mustard seed, uh, those impossible mountains will move, will move, will move and nothing will be impossible for you. That's what Matthew says. 
faith is still the substance of what we're hoping for. That's what the Hebrew writer says. And God is still able to do more and abundantly that which we ask. Spurgeon then says, faith makes things possible and love makes things easy. Griffin then adds that hope then makes them all right. Then Vashti got something to say. Then Vashti adds that our hope in Jesus Christ gives us the ability to see the possible good and today yeah and pay pray for the possible good tomorrow uh, even when we face uh, with our own horrendous set uh, of impossibility come on y'all say amen up in here how 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 then how how then does possible become impossible well baby here's how Possible becomes possible on the wings of prayer. Possible becomes possible with the denying of substance. It's called fasting. Possible becomes possible because of faith. It's a faith that rises to meet the future encapsulated in the promises of God that helps us incredibly to see options in our challenges instead of challenges in our opportunity. Faith helps us to see options in our crises and alternatives in our predicaments, what you say. Well, well, I hate to tell you, but I love it when we get to the part, at least I do, I don't know about you, when I get to the part, the what you say part uh, in the sermon, you know, the what you say part. Uh, Jesus said, oh yes, he did. Uh, with man, this is impossible, uh, but with God, all things are possible. Uh, what you say, yeah, for nothing is impossible with God. Uh, what you say, yeah, nothing is too hard for God. Uh, what you say, yeah, faith through grace makes salvation possible. Uh, what you say, yeah, the joy of the Lord uh, makes our strength possible. Uh, what you say, yeah, the blood of Jesus Christ shed uh, on an ignominious cross uh, makes the forgiveness of sin possible. Uh, what you say, yeah, new mercies arrive every morning uh, makes life possible. Uh, what you say, uh, the love of the Lord turns revenge uh, into mercy, uh, hatred uh, into forgiveness, uh, anger uh, into patience, uh, fear uh, into faith. Uh, God's love uh, makes humility possible, uh, gener generosity possible, uh, hope possible, uh, peace possible. Uh, what you say. The gift of eternal life makes heaven possible. And the gift of the Holy Spirit makes power possible. But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. What you say? And the Holy Spirit makes possible the unity of all believers. As different as all of us is, to help us unite the followers of Jesus Christ into a living body called church, which Christ dwells and continues the work of redemption. What you say? Can I exegete the text now? Here, here we find Paul facing his own set of impossibilities. He's facing insurmountable possibilities triggered by the struggle to make the right decision. In the decision matrix are several personalities. There is Julius, who represents the military power of Rome. He is the one in charge of the prisoners on board the ship. There is the owner of the ship, perhaps the one who owns most of the cargo, who represents capital and commerce. There is another man, a third man, the captain of the boat, who represents specialized knowledge. He has know-how and training and experience of the sea. And finally, there is Paul, who represents Jesus Christ. He is the preacher and the prisoner. The issue, should they cross the Mediterranean Sea 
in a stormy period of the year or should they spend the winter where they are? Paul had been arrested after preaching for several years and when he's threatened with death, he appeals as a, as a Roman citizen for his trial to be held in the city of Rome, which is his right. And he is now on board under heavy guard. Julius, the Roman power, wants to sail. The owner feels they should sail. The captain is willing to sail. Only Paul feels they should go no further. But what does Paul know? He is not a trained sailor. He has no expertise and experience on the sea. He has no education was and training NBA in plan. commerce. And he has Damn no degree kids. in capital acquisition or trading. Is, uh... And so they set sail and soon calm winds turn to strong winds. And they find themselves tossed day and night by, by a wild series of storms. The situation aboard the ship is hopeless and the men are ready to give up in despair. They're sure that death is near. They haven't seen the sun or the moon or the stars in many days and there's no 21st century navigation equipment on board either. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they've been because the wind takes them this way and then takes them that way and they don't know where they're going. You're in a storm so deep and so long that you can't see your way forward and you can't see your way on either side. You can't see where you've been and can't return there and you can't push forward. The sun, the moon, and the stars, all of these are landmarks that you use to help you find your way. Now your way is obscured. And so they huddle together on the deck in the hold of the ship. They're anxious, they're fearful and terrified. It's impossible. The storm is not ending. And all they see is the storm. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? That all you see is, is the storm. And it doesn't matter whether the storm is an emotional storm that crashes into your sanity with waves that wash away your peace. It doesn't matter whether it's a financial storm that floods out your budget and drowns your dreams. It doesn't matter whether it's a political storm that washes away savings and investments or relational storm that disrupts uh, marital bliss uh, or the storms that may erupt between parents and children or between good friends that washes away a good doing relationship, or the terrifying tempest that comes between you and God. And all you can see is storm. It's a darker time than anyone has ever encountered. And in the middle of that kind of hopeless situation, finally the preacher stands up stands up among them and say, don't be anxious, don't quit, but be of good cheer. Now, Paul must have lost his mind. He must be mad, he must have gone crazy. Can't he see how impossible his situation is? Can't he hear the hallowing winds of impossibility? Can't he feel the rocking and the reeling and the reeling and the rocking impossibility of a storm tossed ship? What's up, Paul, what's up, Paul? Well, it's not what's up, Paul, it's what's up, God. They may have known the sea. They may have understood counting and accounting in commerce. They may have understand the power and the military might of Rome, but they miss God. The one who knew God was the one who stood up. And his testimony is this, for there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whose I serve. And he promised me not only my life, but promised me yours. I believe God. So cheer up for I believe God. Here, Bishop Fuel is a confident faith. It's a bold, hoary faith. It's a ridiculous faith. It's a crazy faith. It's an unshakable faith that refuses to be diminished in the face of impossibilities, but rises to meet the impossibilities with I believe God in the discussion. Don't you wish you could do that when you face your own impossibilities? <laughs> I believe God. 
end of discussion. It's a hold on a little while longer faith. It's a though he slay me yet will I trust in faith. I believe God in the discussion. It's believing before you seeing faith. It's not believing. It's not seeing in believing faith. I believe God in the discussion. Ha! Huh. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's a in the storm kind of faith. Not after the storm has passed over kind of faith. Uh, I believe God in the discussion. Paul knew that his value and worth was not rooted in what other people think, but what the Lord thinks. He knew that his value and worth in life was root, rooted not in what other people did, but what God did. And if you spend your whole life counting on the opinions of others and all your time worrying about what they going to do and what they said and what they did, you'll be paralyzed by fear instead of propelled forward by faith. You just got to believe God. End of discussion. Woo! It's the kind of faith that believes absolutely in the divine help of God, that God can and that God will and that God wants to on behalf. And, but then God also has something for you to do. And so then Paul now comes in our text uh, and gives some very sensible, practical advice that may also help us when we find ourselves in a storm. Uh, are you ready? Tell your neighbor I'm ready. If you're ready, tell your neighbor I'm ready. The first thing, thing that Paul says is stick with the ship. Tell your neighbor, stick with the ship. Some of the crew wanted to embark on their own. I'm going to save myself. I don't care what happened to the rest of y'all. I just want to get what I need to get. Forget what happens to everybody else. But Paul reminds them that they must stay together. Faith is always a uniting and cohesive force. Faith is never divisive, a divisive one. Stick with the ship. Because if you stick with the ship, you'll be able to pull your intellectual resources, your spiritual resources. You'll be able to pull your expertise and the experience of others still on the ship with you. Stick with the ship. It's the same with them. And it's the same in our churches today. Yeah, we need everybody. I said everybody. Did I say everybody before? We need everybody uh, in an uncertain season uh, where you have to pivot uh, from preaching in the church uh, to preaching in your living room, uh, preaching to a camera uh, instead of preaching to people. Amen. Uh, at a time when we face our own set of impossibilities, uh, we need to have our hands on that. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Paul first tells them to stick with the ship. And secondly, he says, stabilize the situation. Paul then suggests, let down your anchors and wait for the day. It does seem rather obvious, doesn't it? Since it's dark and you can't navigate and you can't see the sun, the moon, nor the stars, you may be drifting further away from where you want to go, or you may be nearing reefs of rock. Uh, let's be practical. Let's be sensible. Let's put our anchors down and wait for the day. Maybe we'll be able to see something and more advisedly assess our situation. This is a common sense moment, uh, isn't it? Certainly, the example suggests to us uh, that now Paul is saying, let's stabilize, uh, let's get a grounding, uh, and let's Let's make sure we're safe where we are. Uh, all of us, amen, uh, needs to put our faith into something solid. Uh, where are your anchors, beloved, uh, for your life when a crisis comes along? Uh, what do you have that you're holding on to? Uh, to whom do you look for guidance? Uh, what are your absolutes uh, that hold you uh, when the storm begins to blow you in every which way? Uh, everybody needs to sit down uh, and sort out what you actually believe for sure uh, uh, that is relative to your faith. Uh, what are your absolute uh, things for which you will stake your life on? Come here, Isaiah. Tell us uh, where do you stand? Uh, he says, I lay a tested stone, uh, a precious cornerstone uh, for a sure foundation. Uh, how, uh, come on, uh, stand up and tell me what you got. Where, where does your anchor? Uh, my anchor is the one who relies uh, on it will never be stricken with panic. Uh, uh, how, what's your anchor? Uh, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stand for it. That's where I stand. What? Where, where do you stand? I resist 
resist the devil. Stand firm in faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is go ongoing some kind of struggle. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll fastened to the rock that cannot move. Grounded firm deep in the Savior's love. I don't know about you, but it would be hard for me to live a life of faith without something to hold on to. What's your anchor? This is my anchor. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That's my anchor. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, that's my anchor, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. I wish I had somebody on an altar, on the organ right now. That, that's my anchor. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. That's my anchor. He descended into hell. Uh, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. Uh, oh, sitting at the right hand uh, of the Father. From thence he shall come uh, to judge the quick and the dead. Uh, that's my anchor. Uh, I believe in the Holy Ghost, uh, the church universal, uh, the communion of saints, uh, and uh, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the resurrection of the body, uh, and life everlasting. Uh, Amen. Now, that's my anchor. Huh? What's your anchor? Huh? You got to have something uh, to hold you uh, when the storms toss uh, you to and fro. Well, first thing, Paul says, stick with the ship. Second, put your anchor down. And third, lighten your load. You are carrying too much stuff. And some things need to be thrown away. When you're in a storm, lighten the load. Get rid of some unnecessary stuff. Uh -huh. There's some people uh -huh, who are hindering your progress. Uh, it's time to lighten your load. Uh, there's some possessions that you no longer need. Uh, you need to declutter uh, and get it out of the way of clear thinking. Uh, there's some arsenic personalities uh, that's poisoning your well. Uh -huh. There's some arrogance. Uh, you need to let it go. Uh, there's some pride. Uh, you need to let it go. Uh, there's some ego. Uh, you need to let it go. There's some selfishness. You need to let it go. There's some self-righteousness. You need to let it go. Look over everything that weighs you down. As the Hebrew writer suggests, even the sins that so easily besets us. Or Paul says, what? Stick with the ship. Put your anchors down. Lighten your load. And finally, stick with God. Paul knew that the outcome of the trip uh, would be disastrous. Uh, they were all going to die, uh, but he still prayed anyhow. Uh, he said, stick with God. Uh, fear and panic uh, sets in uh, as the winds and the wave uh, kept them from being able to accurately gauge the distance to the shore. Uh, they knew they were close to land, uh, but they didn't know how close. Uh, so they decided to ban abandon ship. Uh, Paul wasn't fooled. Uh, he told the centurion, uh, who knows now he was willing to listen to Paul, uh, to Paul's advice. Uh, the soldiers cut the lifeboat uh, and it drifted away. Uh, but Paul said, be of good cheer. Uh, don't be anxious. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, don't quit. Uh, I believe God uh, in a discussion. Uh, so they ate uh, and threw the rest overboard. Uh, there was no more lifeboat. Uh, it had drifted away. Yeah, no more equipment or cargo. The only thing they had left uh, was the prisoners and the soldiers. Uh, and the soldiers will be held accountable uh, for every prisoner. Uh, and their remedy was to kill them all. Uh, but thank God for the centurion uh, who wanted Paul to remain alive. Uh, so he gave the order uh, that no one was to be killed. Uh, tell your neighbor, stick with God. Uh, he then ordered everyone who knew how to swim, uh, y'all jump overboard uh, and head for land. Uh, everybody else would find a plank, uh, find a barrel uh, or anything they could float uh, and hang on uh, and let the waves take you to shore. Uh, in the end, uh, everybody gathered on the beach together uh, and saw that Paul was right. Uh, don't be anxious, uh, be of good cheer. Uh, don't quit, uh, believe in God. Uh, 
stick with God uh, in the discussion. Uh, and so they came. Uh, some swam, uh, some on boards, uh, but they all reached uh, the shore alive. Uh, and sometimes it's all you can do uh, is hang on to whatever you got to hang on to uh, and stick with God. Uh, you'll never know uh, what shape your faith is in uh, until it is tried in the storm. Uh, You'll only learn more about yourself uh, in a storm, uh, but you'll also learn uh, more about God than you ever imagined. Uh, this is what I know. Uh, what do you know, Bishop? Uh, this is what I know. Uh, when uh, I was tried, uh, when uh, I was tossed to and fro, uh, when uh, things got worse uh, and not better, uh, when uh, the unexpected happened, uh, when uh, life did didn't live up to my expectation uh, when uh, life came at me fast uh, I found out that God uh, was still God uh, and God is still able uh, I came to know God at a deeper level uh, you'll be able to hear the whispers of the Lord uh, about the sound of the storm uh, and be at peace uh, and a change came over me uh, that I found out that God is still able again uh, in my storm, I know. What do you know, Bishop? I know that God is still God, and God is still in control, and God will guide us in any storm, and God will be with you in the storm, before the storm, and after the storm, when better won't get better. Has it ever happened to you? For beloved, I know a storm will shape you, a storm will handle you. And a storm will give you the capability to handle the whatever. So you know what I mean by the whatever. Whatever happens, God is still able. Whatever it is, God is still able. Whatever they say, God is still able. Whatever they did, God is still able. Whatever the future, God is still able. Whatever my present situation, God is still able. God helped you through this, for God will help you through that. For God majors in turning our possibilities around. So when storms continue to work on you, remember God is still able. When stuff happens that you didn't expect, remember God is still able. When the storms of life block every good thing, remember God is still able. Remember when the storms overwhelm you, God is still able. When the enemy tempts you uh, to quit and walk away, uh, remember that God is still able. Uh, when the enemy throws everything at you but the kitchen sink, uh, God is still able. Uh, and when you look up and the kitchen sink is coming in your direction, uh, God is still able. Uh, when you get stronger with every attack of the enemy, uh, that's God's ableness in your life. Uh, remember our God is a awesome God. Uh, he reigns from heaven above. Uh, when he says no is no. Uh, when God God says yes is yes no matter what it looks like God is still able no one or entity has the power of God every person and every knee must bow down to the Lord every bowed knee must bow and every tongue must confess so don't get mad when storms keep coming don't get mad when stuff keeps snapping smile knowing that the enemy thought enough of you to spend time on you because he wouldn't spend time on you uh, if you didn't have some anointing uh, if you weren't going somewhere uh, if you weren't up to something uh, or God wasn't up to something in your life uh, God is still able that's what I know uh, I don't know nothing else uh, I believe God uh, that's the end of discussion uh, that's it uh, that's final no more declaration no more shout no more not. I'm through I'm finished y'all go ahead and praise the Lord I don't hear enough praise in the house. Maybe God hadn't brought you through yet. I don't hear enough praise in the house. God hasn't blessed you. All I know is that God is still able. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus. 
We come with grateful hearts tonight. Because storms that the enemy intended to diminish our faith increased our faith. And we thank you for your keeping power and your staying power in our lives. Oh, Lord, we love you. And we want to be among the ones who come back to say thank you for what you've already done. And we just want to say thank you for what you can do in the future. Because now we have a track record and a testimony that you brought us safe thus far and we're trusting you to take us all the way. So now, Lord, turn the impossibilities to possible in the lives of your people who are gathered within your gates today. Help them to see a brighter future. Help them to take their eyes off the storm and put their eyes on you. Help them today to hold on. Be of good cheer. Don't be anxious or afraid that we'll be able to declare we believe in you. End of discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whether you're standing or sitting in the sanctuary or viewing virtually, God is able. Able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever imagine. Remember, as we stick with it, as we pursue and don't throw in everything, stay some, take some stuff and toss it aside, but keep the good things. As we are in God's house, I believe it is our opportunity not only to receive him, but also to renew our relationship with him. It's been a journey these last couple of years, but now is the time for renewal, restoration, and realignment in our walk. So if you're here in God's house today, and you have never received him as your personal savior. This is your opportunity to do that. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or viewing 
virtually. You said, preacher, what does that look like? What it looks like is just like this. Lord, I, I know you're able. So now I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. Come into my heart. I surrender all to you. If that's you this day, if you will just lift your hands in the sanctuary, or if you're viewing virtually, if you will just put it in the chat or in the inbox, wherever you need to do it, know that someone will respond to the call. God is able. Do you believe it? God is able. Do you trust him? God is able. As we sing the final stanza of this song, I surrender all. Won't you receive him as Lord and Savior? Surrender all. I trust you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Remember, God is able to take what seems impossible and make it possible. Let the church say amen. Let the church say man again. Dr. Harold Mayberry will make the appeal this evening. We prepare for our moments of giving. Come on, all over the house, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for blessing us as the Lord has blessed us tonight. Fifth District, your stewardship for this meeting has been phenomenal. God has richly blessed us. And on behalf of the Finance Committee, I want to thank you for exercising outstanding stewardship. As we come tonight, we're asking those persons who will share in this opening worship service to allow the Lord to move on your spirit and share $100. When you think about God's goodness, that's not a lot to ask. And so for those persons who desire to give by cash app, whether it be in the sanctuary or online, the cash app, which you've heard earlier, is dollar sign fifth, that's the number five, dollar sign fifth A-M-E. If you desire to give through Givelify, it's fifth Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. If you wish to mail your offering in, you may do so by sending it to 4519-4519 Admiralty Way, Suite 205, Marina Del Rey, California, 90292. Also, we have someone available who will receive your gift by debit card or credit card. All over the church, won't you stand right now? All over the church, won't you stand? The ushers are going to direct you as we prepare to bless the Lord with our gifts. I just want you to direct the worshipers now. The checks should be made payable to the 5th District Fund. The 5th District Fund.
right is going to receive the debit card or credit card if you wish to give your offering by debit card or credit card. Reverend Ray is on my right. <laughs> 